Alrighty, strokes, impressionists, and uh, the CSPS2 trial. So several trials have been done with uh, various agents over various periods regarding secondary stroke treatment. Chance and Point helped everyone understand the uh, large TIA small stroke rationale for dual antiplatelet therapy in the short term while keeping folks in the know about the dangers of long-term double antiplatelet therapy. Um, <clears throat> much like impressionism, when you look really close at the data, it's hard to know what you're looking at, but when you take a big step back and appreciate the, uh, the greater uh, picture of things, it can make quite an impression. Impressionism is a style from the mid-19th century where darkness and lines do not exist. Uh, much like how we'll see that the lines are blurred between ideal antiplatelet therapies and uh, CVA, I hope we'll also get a good appreciation of some strokes uh -huh, and how they uh, make Impressionism just so damned fun. So aspirin had been used as the go-to for stroke prophylaxis forever, and the Capri trial looked uh, to see how it would fare against another antiplatelet agent in clopidogrel which ends up inhibiting ADP-mediated uh, GP2B3A platelet activation. Um, now, we're not going to talk about point, the trial, but we'll be talking about pointillism because Signac, as well as Sura, go in that direction, and because these points kind of look like platelets, which are very apropos to the topic at hand. The Capri trial, the inspiration uh, for this slide, uh, which is Venice, though still Italy, like Capri, sets the stage for the stroke revolution we're going to be talking about, both medically and artistically. Uh, the inclusion criteria... Oh, where'd it go? Here we go. Uh, stroke, older than one week, under six months, some peripheral vascular disease, or MI. Exclusion uh, criteria. Uncontrolled hypertension, weird uh, CBCs, uh, predisposing to bleeding or a life expectancy under three years. In terms of the primary outcomes, looking at clopidogrel versus aspirin with regards to stroke, MI, and intracranial uh, hemorrhage, as well as all-cause mortality as primary and secondary outcomes, respectively. Now, Signac had his own primary outcomes and goals, namely anarchism. Uh, which was in vogue in the late 1800s, uh, the goal of which was the elimination of illegitimate authority with the hopes of creating some sort of harmony. The idea is that the current standing order, both artistically in realism as well as medically in aspirin, uh, these things, or the standing order, does not stand against chaos but perpetuates it uh, by holding onto hierarchy and creating tension and conflict. In the 90s, uh, we still didn't have anything better than aspirin, which was as old as Impressionism. Pointillism is anarchistic in its fight against the current order as well as reckless individuality, hence an artistic style against the current order of realism, see Courbet, uh, that emancipates the individual, like a dot, in a sea of solidarity with, uh, with other dots. or strokes. Capri and uh, Capodagro had that same effect. The trial showed a decrease in clustered ischemic stroke, MI and vascular death, though led primarily by peripheral arterial disease. However, this revolution, like all revolutions, was bloody, as Capodagro was associated with more severe any bleeding but uh, decreased GI and intracerebral hemorrhages. This is very nice. This is Van Gogh. Although Chance and Point uh, talk about the short-term effects of dual antiplatelet therapy, Match does it in the long haul. The question is, uh, is aspirin and clopidogrel therapy after a stroke better than aspirin monotherapy? We had already seen how clopidogrel could be used instead of aspirin, um, but the question is now, is two better than one? <clears throat> so inclusion criteria. Patients who had had an ischemic stroke or a TIA in the past three months with either a previous stroke, peripheral arterial disease, which is where clopidogrel and the Capri trial really shined, 
MI angina or diabetes as comorbidities. Speaking of comorbidities, this is Vincent van Gogh who matches haha, the dual theme of the trial, much like his own trial, his life. Some people say Van Gogh was bipolar. It gives people something to talk about and feel cool, I guess. But this concept of two is very appropriate for a trial of two-stroke agents. In fact, by the later 1880s, Van Gogh was notorious for a two-agent approach. And you can actually see that here. You look at the brush strokes, and you will see alternating colors. One, two, one, two. Kind of like right here. Boom, 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 boom. Same thing going on here. Yellow, tan, yellow, tan, yellow, tan, yellow, tan. And you see it with all his other strokes, not just in this painting, but also in the previous one. You look at the ground here, and you'll see orange mud, orange mud, orange mud. Look at the trees, orange, green, orange, green, orange, green. The skies, too, alternating colors. This duality, this one-two theme, just like aspirin and clopidogrel. And uh, in painting, it creates a strong product. So the trial was done over 18 months, just like Van Gogh, who spent 12 to 18 months at the insane asylum before he took his life. Exclusion criteria. Uh, like most people in mental asylums at the time, no people over 40 were allowed. Also, there could be no patients with uh, peptic ulcer disease in both the trial and Van Gogh's asylum because apparently the food was very spicy. Primary outcome, MI ischemic stroke hemorrhage. Secondary outcome, death uh, MI or hemorrhage. Unfortunately, much like Van Gogh's trial in the mental facility, there was no benefit of double therapy in the trial for TA stroke, and in fact, a huge drawback in that there was a lot of bleeding, the kind of bleeding uh, one would get when cutting off one's ear. As an aside, uh, Van Gogh's brother, Theo, um, died a year after Van Gogh after losing his mind. Uh, despite not having been mentally ill. They did live together in Paris, which has led uh, some to speculate they both had tertiary syphilis, since Parisian syphilis and prostitutes are both known to be wonderfully aggressive. Renoir is my favorite painter, and it's not even close. Everything he does is beautiful and full of light and life for my money, which uh, at this point is not much. He is the spirit of art, or as they say in French, the esprit, much like this trial. And this is just beautiful. Look at this. Look at this. <clears throat> just as how Renoir wonderfully captures the spirit of art, in 1881, after a voyage to Rome, his style, his spirit, or esprit, uh, changes as well. And we'll look at that change. The esprit trial looks at aspirin and diapyramidol, versus aspirin in terms of stroke prophylaxis. Renoir's spirit, or esprit, is less bloody than Van Gogh's, um, which of course was the goal. Everyone had kind of freaked out after match, uh, just like some of the uh, residents uh, or medical students watching right now. Inclusion criteria. TIA or a minor ischemic stroke in the past six months, exclusion criteria, cardiac source of TIA, so something like AFib, uh, or source of it being a TIA or a stroke, um, with you know either an AFib history, some sort of valvular heart disease, a previous carotid endarterectomy, or a planned carotid uh, intervention, and of course, uh, coagulopathies. The trial, open. Interesting, interesting. So the primary outcome was the composite death rate of all vascular events as well as non-fatal strokes, MIs, bleeding events. Secondary outcomes seemed to be any sort of bleeding. Um, just like our trial, Renoir uh, favors smaller strokes, and you can say that he too was not blinded and that his eyes were um, wide open to the cool new developments of the world. He had just been to Rome and probably saw some cool stuff. One of the criticisms people had of Renoir during this time was the range of what he would use for his strokes. Just as Esprit here uh, has people from 325 to 30 milligrams of aspirin, Renoir would dabble with big, uh, big brushes as well as smaller ones. 
But uh, much like our trial, starting in 1888, his colors and brushwork became more soft and light, much like the overall aspirin dosing on the lighter side of things, um, 30 milligrams. The result? Decrease in vascular deaths as well as non-fatal vascular problems or events. All-cause mortality of dipyramidal and aspirin was not significant compared to aspirin, and there was no advantage regarding major bleeding. However, there seemed to be a, a decrease in uh, ischemic stroke prevention. Renoir's atelier was open, in keeping with the spirit of the times, but uh, Esprit was also an open trial, which kind of calls into questions a lot of these results. Weird aspirin dosages uh, might also account for weird outcomes. Uh, 30 milligrams. This is wonderful. Um, I think this is uh, Boulevard Montmartre. Pizarro uh, is considered the father of Impressionists, not because he invented it, but because of his role in its flourishing and the constant uh, evolution of his art, which all other Impressionists admired. The PROFESS trial is similar. It's not the first antiplatelet therapy trial. It's not even the first double antiplatelet therapy trial. But it was a lot more robust uh, than some of the others. In previous trials, there had been some glaring questionable decisions. Renoir and Esprit was open label with weird variable aspirin dosing. And Van Gogh's match was a bloody mess. PROFESS, much like Pizarro finds itself trying to compete for renown, kind of like how Pizarro is overshadowed by the Monets and Renoirs and Van Goghs of the world. Aspirin with dipyramidal was not shown to be superior to aspirin in that last trial we looked at. So the new question was, well, can we say it's superior to Plavix? And, and then because of Capri, we can, see, we can say that in some regards it's uh, better than aspirin. Pizarro was always changing his style, just like Profess. Starting here, kind of looks like a Manet a little bit. You've got kind of these uh, little dark colors right here. You don't see a lot of that with uh, a lot of the Impressionists and stuff, you know. Um, doesn't seem as, as uh, light and lively as uh, at least that uh, Las Renoir we were looking at. Um, but, you know, then we have, you know, something that could very easily be a Van Gogh. We have the, the alternating, um, you know, light, dark, light, dark, with alternating colors, uh, and we could be very well fooled if we weren't too careful and astute. Similarly, we have this evolution uh, present in the PROFESS trial. The original inclusion criteria were stroke and patient over 55 and over um, within 90 days. And then they decided to, to change it to, to patients 50 and over who had had a stroke in the past 90 days or 120 days if uh, you had two additional risk factors consider things like hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, peripheral vascular disease. Exclusion criteria, uh, any contraindication to antiplatelet therapy, bleeding, coagulopathy, some, some sort of kidney or, or liver issue. <clears throat> Primary outcome, any stroke. Secondary outcome was the composite of stroke, MIs, or vascular death. You kind of see this, this happening a lot, these, these composites. Pissarro believed that the, the way to continue uh, great art was to set aside the big narratives and ambitions and just trust the process. Unlike Esprit, Profess was double-blinded. Unlike Esprit, the dosing of aspirin was constant, though like Esprit, a uh, low dose of aspirin dominated the picture, uh, 25, with uh, 200 of dipyramidal being done twice daily. We can see that uh, Pizarro was bold. Similarly, Profess was bold because it was not planned to be a non-inferiority trial, um, but uh, was planned to test the superiority, the superiority of aspirin and dipyramidal over clopidogrel. Hopefully, with more regards to, uh, hopefully with regards to more than non-fatal stroke. Um, it was set up as a non-inferiority trial. I'm sorry, it was set up 
It was not set up as a non-inferior Torah, it was a superiority trial, and it failed to confident in itself. So just to kind of recap the last little bit, a little confusing, it was set up as a superiority trial, failed that, um, which is unfortunate, which is unfortunate. Our friend Renoir uh, says beauty in art is cope from an inability to perfectly capture reality, which is the fatal goal. And in this failure uh, to make beauty to overcome technical shortcomings. Per him, uh, technical perfection only creates boredom, and when technique is perfected, everything becomes ugly. Look no further than the Brock of the world. And, uh, and this abomination. Uh, there was no doubt Dali perfected a uh, technique, and I would say uh, there have been no great painters since. Uh, but I say that art has uh, changed. It is not dead. Look at uh, artists like Lichtenstein. Make some cool stuff. So we have spent the last bit looking at strokes, both with a focus on antiplatelet therapy as well as impressionists. But when it comes to the art and CVA prophylaxis, as well as the art of CVA prophylaxis, have we already achieved Renoir's dreaded perfection? I don't think so. Not when you consider that in cancers you have third and fourth line options, each with different mechanisms of action. And in CVA prophylaxis, in one way or another, the focus has uh, mainly been on aspirin um, or aspirin lookalikes. But what if there was more to an artist's stroke than, uh, than an easel and primary hemostasis? Back at the, the height of Impressionism, Rudolf Virchow had shown how stasis, a hypercoagulable state, and vascular damage affected clots and strokes. And now there is change in the development of strokes, not just medical, but artistic as well. Rafi Ganadol um, has taken the strokes of the 19th century masters and is absolutely electric on his digital canvas. Similarly, our friends out east are pushing CVA prophylaxis and prevention into the 21st century by looking at things uh, a different way. How? Virchow. And uh, for those of you interested, uh, there is a, a, a wonderful um, Rafi Ganadol little thing over at uh, Palazzo Strozzi, I believe, in uh, Florence, where they're doing uh, also a Donatello exhibit, and it's absolutely delightful. Salastazol is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, specific for phosphodiesterase 3. For our purpose, it has two purposes. Hmm. 
Here we go. In the vasculature, uh, it prevents the degradation of cyclic AMP and allows for vasodilation. In platelets, phosphodiesterase inhibitors allow cyclic AMP um, to stop platelets from expressing glycoprotein 2B3A and getting uh, primary hemostasis underway. Aspirin, a uh, cyclooxygenase inhibitor, uh, decreases thromboxane A2 production, which decreases the amount of thromboxane floating around and uh, activating uh, glycoprotein uh, 2B3A. Out east, it had been shown that salostazole was better than a placebo regarding stroke prevention, but that was an underpowered Chinese study, uh, CSPS, I believe. So the good folks over in Japan created an overpowered uh, Japanese study to see if salostazole was not inferior uh, to aspirin. What's the end point in strokes and in art? If you ask our good friend Jean Renoir, he will tell you uh, to make something beautiful without making a bloody mess of things. In a stroke of luck, with strokes, uh, it looks like the goal has been to prevent future strokes without making a bloody mess of things, without hemorrhage. Well, uh, there's nothing more beautiful than life, and the Impressionists were so good at making it all so beautiful and showing there's nothing more beautiful than a life well lived. In order to continue a beautiful life, CSPS2 had the primary outcome as recurrence of an ischemic CVA as well as an intraparenchymal or a subarachnoid hemorrhage, both of which can be pretty life-changing. Again, as in other previous trials, the primary outcome was any stroke occurrence. As a secondary endpoint, the trial looked at uh, TIA, death of any cause, MI, heart failure, and, or any sort of non-cerebral subarachnoid hemorrhage that led to a hospital admission. Mm. Inclusion criteria. Uh, you had to be Japanese. Uh, this was in Japan. Uh, have a non-cardioembolic stroke in the past 26 weeks and uh, be of age um, 20 to 79. Exclusion criteria. Art, much like trials, can also be exclusionary, either too expensive to get access or filled with esoteric bullshit that serves as its own gatekeeper. In this trial, the, the people could not have any risks of hemorrhage like peptic ulcers or contraindications to antiplatelet therapy. No blood, hepatic, renal diseases predisposing to cardioembolic strokes. Got to think of things like uh, cancer with a prothrombotic state, liver coagulopathy, things like lupus. You could not have a history of PCI and no history of cerebral revascularization. People were also double-blinded and uh, dummied to 100 milligrams of uh, twice-a-day salostazole or aspirin, 81 milligrams, and they had a five-year follow-up. The dummying is important just because of uh, the way that the actual um, pills look, and sometimes you can tell what you're getting based on, um, based on the differences of uh, physically what you're getting. And although something may be blinded, you can still kind of see, hmm, what's going on here? So the hazard ratio, the hazard ratio of aspirin to a placebo for stroke onset was uh, calculated to be 0 0.6. And similarly, as we've seen with uh, clopidogrel, the hazard ratio of silostazole sorry, so with salastazole, of salastazole to a placebo was calculated to be uh, 0 0.6. The non-inferiority margin was calculated as a hazard ratio of 0 0.8, meaning that if the rate of the primary outcome, in this case ischemic CVA, intraparenchymal, and subarachnoid hemorrhage, and the salastazole group was 0 0.8, the rate as uh, that of the aspirin group, we could say that it was non-inferior. However, the upper 95% of the confidence interval of the hazard ratio of silastazole to aspirin was calculated to be 1.33. Um, it's from this that we get the 0 0.8 as the hazard ratio of non-inferiority. 0 0.6 is the placebo hazard ratio from the CSPS trial in China. Uh, then multiplied by the non-inferiority hazard ratio of 1.33 gives us a new uh, placebo and in aspirin, you can say, hazard ratio of 0 0.798, which is approximately 0 
the hazard ratio of non-inferiority of silostazole um, versus aspirin. The power was set at uh, 0 0.8. Uh, the probability of incorrectly failing to reject the null hypothesis that there was no significant difference between silostazole and aspirin for CVA prevention. And as previously said, the, the people were to be followed for five years. So let's take a look at these results here. It's a lot on one page. Regarding the primary endpoint, it showed more than uh, non-inferiority regarding strokes and subarachnoid hemorrhages, as well as a decrease in hemorrhage, which, if we recall, Capri, uh, Esprit, Profess, um, Match, none of these things really showed any overall benefit of hemorrhage. Of course, you can say, um, you know, clustered in uh, Capri, uh, Clopidogrel didn't, but uh, in terms of uh, GI hemorrhage, it did. Um, but this is a, these are some pretty cool results, but uh, we'll have to talk about some criticisms of this trial and limits to its applicability um, in places that are um, not Japan. So everyone's a critic, both in art and in the real world, and although this trial shows with significance silostazole superiority to aspirin in both ischemic and hemorrhagic decreases, as I was saying, it is not without its flaws. For obvious starters, all the contestants are Japanese and we're not. And I'm not just saying this from an ethnic perspective. Our exposures are different. You'll notice that the average BMI was, uh, was 24 in, uh, in these people, um, which, uh, which is not the case in, uh, in the United States. Not the case at all. Look at that. All right. Additionally, the most prevalent stroke was lacunar, uh, which we don't see as much here, but you certainly see a lot of that uh, out east over in China and in Japan. Um, it may have to do with hypertension being such an issue in the study population uh, when here you have uh, metabolic syndromes and hyperlipidemia kind of dominating the landscape. When we sneak a peek at uh, concomitant meds folks were on, there was uh, maybe some unsatisfactory randomization. As you can see, there was some interaction with um, ACE inhibitors. Um, oh, sorry, no, angiotensin receptor blockers, not ACE inhibitors, sorry. Uh, angiotensin uh, receptor blockers. Uh, and then obviously you have uh, all these people on uh, silostazole who have all these uh, who have all these uh, new effects now. They all have headaches, diarrhea, palpitations, and presyncope. You know, uh, you. Yeah, I guess it's good that you don't have strokes, but I guess it sucks if uh, you start syncopizing. You know. Um, so in my mind, this draws comparisons to chance in the set of. Uh, uh, setting of an Asian population with further need for more, for a more international trial. The the biggest uh, difference between the chance and point of the world and CSPS2 is also the timing and duration of the study. Chance and point, you know, uh, like I was saying earlier, you use that for um, the rationale for uh, you do a couple, two, three weeks of dual antiplatelet therapy before monotherapy because you're essentially looking at 90-day rates. But this is a five-year study uh, with people who have had events in the last 182 days, 26 weeks, 26 weeks. Silostazole is also more expensive than aspirin, and uh, this study was funded by Otsuka Pharmaceuticals, the makers of um, silostazole. Now, the stroke patients... Uh, uh, here are maybe similar to the NHSS, uh, low NHS score, high ABCDE scoring uh, that we use to determine short-term uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in that the supermajority are ranking scale one to two, implying at worst some mild um, disability, but still able to function without needing another person present at home. We still have patients with lacunar infarcts in those... Uh, and in those without it, uh, 
you know, um, if frequent hemorrhage is limiting antiplatelet therapy, it uh, certainly seems that uh, silastazole is uh, reasonable. Of course, here we're looking at the primary um, endpoint. Here we're looking at a uh, composite of the secondary endpoints. And in terms of uh, hemorrhagic events, I would certainly like to be in the silastazole group. So that kind of sums it up, and thank you for your time.